I'm dermatologist and hair specialist, Dr. Jeff Donovan. As you might know, I hold educational webinars for physicians and the general public on various topics in hair loss throughout the year. I really enjoy this, especially the opportunity to conduct question and answer sessions during these webinars. My hope is that these sessions help transform the seemingly complex world of hair loss into something just that much less complex. We had a number of really fantastic questions that came in during our recent webinar, the top 20 studies of 2021. In the next 45 minutes, you'll have an opportunity to hear the answers to these questions. If there's a specific question you're interested in, you'll see a link in the description box below. Or perhaps all questions interest you, and you'll follow me for all 27 questions in the next 45 minutes. Regardless, I hope this is informative and educational in some way, and I thank you very much for watching. First question says, um, is, is topical finasteride to be stopped a few months prior to conception if used in a female, or is it overall discouraged? It's a very, very good question. Um, so topical finasteride is contraindicated, so to speak, in female patients of childbearing age. And so what that means is that when you look at the leaflet of finasteride, you will see this medication should not be used in women of childbearing age. However, a physician in discussions with patients may decide that it is appropriate to use it off-label, provided that patient understands the risks and benefits. Topical finasteride still has risks and still may cause uh, deformities in a fetus. Um, we don't have proof in medical studies that it does, but we know that topical finasteride is still absorbed into the body, and so it must be assumed that it may cause harm to a baby. And so um, in a woman who is using topical finasteride and with her physician, it's decided that this is the right treatment to use. Um, it certainly does need to be stopped before conception. And there are female patients in the world of childbearing age who use topical and oral finasteride off-label. The vast majority of them will be on various contraceptive methods if there is a chance of becoming pregnant. That may include oral contraceptives, but it may include other methods of birth control. We do believe that finasteride disappears from the body um, very quickly once a person stops. That's very different from other antiandrogens like dutasteride. So we are specifically speaking now to finasteride. We know with finasteride that it's probably out of the body well, probably in weeks, but generally a month or two is safe to assume that it's out of the body. We don't have any reason to believe that topical finasteride should be any different. And so the answer to this question is, first and foremost, this discussion needs a very in-depth discussion with one's provider to realize that this is an off-label use. But um, there are many women in the world that stop finasteride a month or two prior to conception and have healthy children, and we do not have any indication that um, there's any harm that comes from that. So I thank you for that great question. So we have another question that says, my punch biopsy shows focal superficial perifollicular lymphocytic inflammation. Two terminal hair follicles show perifollicular concentric fibroplasia. Let me see if there's anything else. So um, thank you for this question. Focal um, superficial perifollicular lymphocytic inflammation means there's inflammation around the hair follicle. And that is a nonspecific finding in um, androgenetic hair loss, in scarring alopecia, in other conditions as well. So that finding in and of itself doesn't tell me one way or the other what the diagnosis is. Two hair follicles show perifollicular concentric fibroplasia. 
that too can be seen in androgenetic hair loss. It can be seen in scarring alopecia. And so it also does not tell me the diagnosis. Fibroplasia means scar tissue that's wrapped like a blanket around the hair follicle. When there's mild fibroplasia, that can be many things. When there's dense fibroplasia, where the blanket of scarring is just intense, that's more in keeping with a scarring alopecia. The key question in these biopsies is what is happening to the sebaceous glands, the oil glands? And so if this biopsy shows loss of sebaceous glands, it certainly would be suggestive of a scarring alopecia. And if this biopsy shows that some of the hair follicle cells are dying, we call that necrosis or lichenoid change, that would be also very suggestive of a scarring alopecia. But these two pieces of information here do not tell us one way or the other. And so we really need more inflama information about the inflammation. We have a question, how do you reduce the burning with lichen plano pilaris? Well, we reduce the burning in lichen plano pilaris by all of the treatments that we know that reduce inflammation. And so there are about 25 treatments for lichen plano pilaris, ranging from topical steroids to steroid injections, to hydroxychloroquine, to doxycycline, to methotrexate, to apremilase, to low-dose naltrexone, to PRP, to mycophenolates, and the list goes on and on. Any of these treatment options have the potential to reduce burning in lichen plano pilaris. The thing we always have to ask ourselves is, this patient has burning, but is the burning coming from the lichen plano pilaris? or is the burning coming from something else? That's a more challenging question. Burning often is from the scarring alopecia, but burning can come from um, allergy to hair dyes, allergy to shampoo products. Uh, burning can come from uh, scalp dysesthesias, where the scalp just wants to fire these signals. Burning can come from stress. Burning can come from um, severe untreated seborrheic dermatitis, which is a cousin of dandruff. And so in anyone with burning, we really need to try to do the detective work to figure out what is the cause of the burning. Sometimes it's challenging, but often by treating the lichen plano pilaris with these methods, we often solve the burning. Uh, thank you for that question. And so, could a cooling machine help stop the burning symptoms in FFA and LPP? What should you do if clobetazole doesn't work to stop burning and tenderness besides putting cool compresses on the scalp? So it's a great question, thank you. So clearly burning is an issue in many of these scarring alopecias. Um, again, any of these options could potentially help stop burning. Sometimes we get burning because the alcohol in the clobetazole formulation is just worsening things. So sometimes switching to a uh, ointment or a cream form of the topical steroid helps. Sometimes um, changing the treatment helps. And so there are not only topical steroids, but there's topical non-steroids like pimecrolimus and tacrolimus, which is used off-label. And these are creams and ointments which are available in drugstores. There's also topical tacrolimus, which can be compounded and used. Um, there's the anti-dandruff shampoos that can be used. But many of these treatments for scarring alopecia the tablet forms like hydroxychloroquine, doxycycline, low-dose naltrexone, antihistamines can also play a very, very important role in managing the burning. And so cool compresses are great. Could a cooling machine help? Um, there's been no studies. Certainly ice packs, ice, you know, freezer packs, frozen peas uh, help a lot. 
and uh, are used by many patients and are, are quite safe provided they're not used too long. A patient asks, I have LPP and hyperlipidemia. Would taking a statin drug help reduce my alopecia as well as my LDL levels? Certainly taking a statin drug increases the chance that it'll help the LDL levels. We don't have a lot of great, great evidence in lichen plano pilaris that statins help the scarring alopecia. It certainly is possible, but those good studies haven't really been done. They have been done in other autoimmune hair loss conditions like alopecia areata, where we commonly use certain um, uh, anti-cholesterol medications like simvastatin. Um, but those studies haven't been done in LPP to any good effect to really know. Uh, and so it's something that really does need to be addressed by the hair loss community. So we don't know yet, but certainly addressing the LDL is a really important goal. How long should a female stay on dutasteride is the next question. So it depends on the diagnosis. If a person has androgenetic hair loss and she's using dutasteride off-label and she's comfortable with the risks and the benefits and she understands it's an off-label use, the answer is forever. Um, we don't use dutasteride very often in women of childbearing age because it stays around in the body a long, long time after the drug is stopped. Um, but if a patient has androgenetic hair loss, all of the treatments are lifelong. If a patient is using dutasteride for frontal fibrosing alopecia, um, the answer is challenging. Because if the patient has androgenetic alopecia too, which many patients do, 50 to 60% of patients with frontal fi fibrosing alopecia also have androgenetic alopecia, the answer is probably lifelong. But if a patient is just using dutasteride to stop the scarring alopecia, the answer is once the scarring alopecia becomes quiet and it stays quiet for, for a year or two, then one can certainly discuss with their physicians whether it's appropriate to start tapering the dose. And if they do, they have to start watching very carefully whether when medication is taken away, does the disease flare. So in androgenetic hair loss, the use of dutasteride is lifelong. In other scarring alopecias, it may not be lifelong, but um, it's used until the scarring alopecia becomes quiet, and then it may be slowly tapered. We have a question that says, is Zyrtec or cetirizine used to control itch and burn, or does it actually help heal LPP? The answer is, is that we are beginning to believe that these antihistamines um, may have a role in actually helping to address some of the underlying inflammatory pathways in lichen plano pilaris. And so um, there has been some studies, um, Devodio being one of the most famous studies of cetirizine or Zyrtec in lichen plano pilaris, showing that um, Zyrtec could reduce the redness and inflammatory features of lichen plano pilaris. Um, and so we're beginning to feel that um, the antihistamines actually help reduce inflammation and they're not just um, stopping the itching. So thank you for that question. Are there pharmacies in Vancouver that reliably compound topical spironolactone for women Considering topical antiandrogens, would spironolactone be preferred over topical finasteride? Um, and so there's becoming increasing number of pharmacies that are uh, able to compound topical spironolactone, topical finasteride. There's a lot of wonderful compounding pharmacies. It's a, it's a big discussion in terms of what to use as the preferred topical antiandrogen. Um, because the studies are limited in women. And so um, it's, a, it's a question that is more involved than would first appear because spironolactone is, has a different safety profile than finasteride. 
um, finasteride is much, much more harmful to young women of childbearing age than is spironolactone, even though women must never become pregnant on either while using either. Um, but we um, need to see the comparative studies of topical finasteride and topical spironolactone really before addressing this fully. But there are good options for both uh, in Vancouver. And I'm happy to give you some suggestions at, at any time in terms of what are all the options, and there's many. So thank you for that great question. Do you recommend doing two biopsies for all diagnoses of alopecia? So it's a great question. And I don't always biopsy every patient that comes in. Trichoscopy, or these handheld magnifying devices that you saw in one of the slides, have really changed dramatically the need for biopsies. And so if I'm 100% confident with what's going on when I see a patient, then I probably won't do a biopsy at all. If I'm not certain and something seems a little challenging, I may do two biopsies because this is pretty challenging. This is pretty unusual. Um, and so I often will do two, but not always. I certainly have been really impressed with the ability of our pathologists um, at the Vancouver General to um, make some diagnoses with one biopsy. And I used to do two often, and then I went to one, and my quality is just as good. Many of the pathologists will take the one biopsy and cut it into two ways. They'll cut it into vertical sectioning and they'll cut it into horizontal sectioning. So many pathologists are very familiar with ways to harness maximal inform information from these biopsies. And so I don't think two biopsies is mandatory. I think two biopsies is absolutely wonderful. Um, if the patient is aware of the fact that it may cause a little scar, if it's not in a, you know, a very sensitive area, uh, I wouldn't do two biopsies from a very frontal hairline in a patient that's rapidly losing their frontal hairline. If that will cause a scar, that wouldn't be my preferred option. Um, but if it's a real challenging diagnosis, I certainly will do two biopsies. Um, patient asks, no note. No note of sebaceous glands on the biopsy, no necrosis. And so thank you for that. Do you suggest compounding minoxidil finasteride and spironolactone? I have also seen compounds with retinoids to improve penetration. Do you recommend that? Thank you so much. Thank you for the comments. So the answer is, should we be taking everything we know of, finasteride, minoxidil, spironolactone, retinoids, Cetirazine, butasteride, bicalutamide. What else is there? There's lots. Should we be putting everything in a lotion and putting it on the scalp? Well, I certainly am of the view that we need to know what we're putting on the scalp. We need to know what's absorbed. We need to know the side effects. So we need to study it really well. Um, and my feeling is, is that if product A let's say minoxidil with finasteride or minoxidil with spironolactone. If that product achieves our goals, improves hair, the patient's very happy, the patient feels this is great, then I'm probably not apt to add more to the topical treatment plan, but we have in reserve other options. And I am absolutely have no hesitation to think about bringing on board minoxidil, spironolactone, finasteride in certain patients provided they're aware of the risks. Similarly, I don't really have any um, hesitancy to add a retinoid, a vitamin A compound to the topical product, but we change the product. We change the product to being one which does get more absorption. We change the product to one that does have the potential for more irritation. And so we have to be careful. Um, there are some patients which will do really well on product A, and then we add some, some vitamin A to the lotion, ask the pharmacist to mix it up with vitamin A. And now we have a product that is causing itching and scaling and flaking and redness, and the patient is miserable and the patient feels, why did you give me this product? And so we have to be careful. 
I think the point of these studies is we really do have a lot of good topical options. We have to better understand how to use them in conjunction, but those studies are underway. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna keep going for a bit. Uh, for those of you who want to sign off, please do, but I appreciate these questions and I'm happy to address them. Do you see high CRP in LPP patients? Inflammation seems to go high in, hand in hand with high CRP. So CRP is an inflammatory marker uh, in the blood. So you can get your blood drawn for CRP. Um, ESR is another one. They're very nonspecific. So there's about 179 reasons to have elevated CRP and 195 reasons to have elevated ESR. We don't tend to see elevated CRP in LPP patients that often. It does occur, but not that often. We do tend to see it more commonly in FFA for reasons we don't fully understand. Um, and so it's an area that we really don't know much about. Um, we don't think about it very often, but um, I think that with this new data tying in the metabolic dysfunction in patients with LPP, the increased cardiovascular risk, I think these are really important questions that we need to ask and um, more studies are needed. Can low level laser therapy be effective in LPP? Can it be done right after corticosteroids? So LPP uh, can have some benefit with low level laser. There are some studies, albeit small, that suggest that the 655 nanometer red light lasers can reduce inflammation uh, in these two scarring alopecias, uh, LPP, um, FFA maybe as well. Um, we don't know really how best to use it. It's probably best to use it when the scalp isn't um, having other products on it, which could potentially block the penetration of the red light laser into the scalp. But again, we don't know. Those studies have not been done, how to combine it with other, with other treatments. Often with patients that are using low level laser um, in my practice, I'm more concerned that they, that they find a reason to not use it. So if we're going to use low level laser, I want patients to use low level laser. And if you've got your scalp with something on it, go ahead and use low level laser. I'd rather you use it and leave it um, you know, in the cupboard or in the cabinet. And so, um, but probably it's best used when there's not a lot of things blocking but we don't know. What blood tests do you order in new patients? Is ANA always included? How about ESR, B12, DHEAS, testosterone? So thank you. It's a, it's a really great question. What blood tests do I order? I think that there's a few blood tests that are really important in all people that say they have hair loss, and that's a CBC or a complete blood count, a thyroid, a TSH, which stands for thyroid stimulating hormone, an iron level, which, which is the ferritin test. Um, and those are probably the key tests. I, I, do, um, I do see a lot of patients that um, have seen a lot of doctors and have complex histories. And so um, I, I do appreciate a lot of blood tests because we often do start systemic therapies the day of the visit. And so sometimes we need to know if the liver's okay and the kidneys are okay <clears throat> and the cholesterol's okay before we start the intended treatment. So it's really nice to have an advanced profile, but it's not crucial for an introductory visit. The key ones are CBC, TSH, and ferritin. And um, the other ones really are ordered on a case-by-case -case basis, in my opinion. Um, I don't order an ANA in every person. If a patient has fatigue, joint pain, strange rashes, ulcers in the mouth, um, dry mouth, dry eyes, uh, some unusual presentation that I'm wondering about an autoimmune diathesis or autoimmune tendency, I will order an ANA, but not routinely. Um, if a patient, if a female patient has irregular periods, um, then I will order often an extended panel um, if the periods are irregular but still occur then often on the third to fifth day I will order uh, an estradiol 
a prolactin, a DHEAS, a testosterone, an androstenedione, a luteinizing hormone, a follicle stimulating hormone, sometimes a 17-hydroxyprogesterone. But in women that have regular periods, that's a very important fact that there's unlikely to be a major hormonal abnormality. And so I don't order the exhaustive hormonal profile in, in many women. But if a female patient has acne and hair growth on the face, that's called hirsutism, then I'll often order a DHEAS and testosterone. But there's no evidence for it to be ordered routinely in healthy patients. Um, Certainly, if a patient is on a lot of medications, um, if a patient is um, having a, some unusual symptoms, um, an extended panel can be very helpful to understand um, liver profiles, um, kidney profiles, a urinalysis. But the key tests are the basic hemoglobin, thyroid, and ferritin. These three tests I cannot do without, but the other ones I think are really on a, on a case, by base, case by case basis. A vegetarian would benefit from a um, B12. A patient who's not on vitamin D and there's questionable uh, vitamin D exposure, sun exposure, a 25 hydroxy vitamin D would be helpful. And. What is your view on the recent rosemary oil versus minoxidil study? If a patient wishes to be more natural, do you recommend it? So there's only one of these rosemary minoxidil studies. It's a good study, 50 patients in each group. There's not 5,000 patients in each group, but there's 50. Um, and so it's a study that I think is interesting. I think it needs to be replicated to either be uh, refuted or to be confirmed. I think that's really, really important. I think the thing that really we need to realize is that the way they compound it in that study must be compounded by an individual who wants to use it. Just getting rosemary from the pharmacy, you go through the tincture, there's rosemary, thyme, lavender. I'm gonna take some rosemary. I'm gonna put it in, I'm gonna put it in um, castor oil. Rosemary castor oil, that may not have the same effect. It may be better, may be worse, may have no effect. So it must be done the same way and it probably needs to be used every day. So the problem with rosemary oil is a lot of patients use it and the data in the differences between men and women are not clear and there's only one study, it needs to be used every day. And so it really needs to be replicated um, patients that are using rosemary oil once a week, twice a week, gain benefit, probably don't have benefit, but again, we don't know that for sure. Um, but I'm waiting for those studies to be replicated. I think they desperately need to be replicated. But if they're going to be used, they need to be used every day. And if there's no improvement after four to six months, they probably should be abandoned. What is your preferred treatment for androgenetic alopecia topically? That's really an easy question, and that's minoxidil. Minoxidil is FDA approved for androgenetic alopecia in women. Minoxidil is FDA approved for androgenetic alopecia in men. And so it's a wonderful starting point for many patients. Many patients don't benefit from it. Many patients don't tolerate it, but it's a great starting point. Do you think we should start seeing AGA as a systemic disease? 100%. 10 years ago, I submitted an, an abstract to an international society to uh, present this very topic that we are doing a disservice to our patients with androgenetic hair loss. And we need to wake up. And we need to fight for them, for the heart disease, strokes, because men and women are dying of heart disease from these unrecognized risks. There's no doubt about it. The data still tells us. Not, not, not my data, the data that's in the literature. That abstract was rejected. I absolutely think that we need to see androgenetic alopecia as, an, as a systemic disease. It absolutely is. 
every consult note of an 18 year old patient and 20 year old patient, you know, usually says, let's get the cholesterol levels. Should we be getting cholesterol levels in a 18 year old male with androgenetic hair loss who's, you know, really thin? Absolutely. We need to know what it is today and we need to follow it in the future. This 18 year old has 80 years of life ahead of him, maybe 100, who knows how long we'll live. So we need cholesterol, we need blood pressure, we need screening glucose, we need hemoglobin A1Cs. We absolutely need these tests. That goes for not only 18 year olds, but 28 year olds, 48 year olds, and 60 year olds. So androgenetic alopecia is a systemic disease. These risks are very real. And um, I think we need to be talking about it. And I think that we really do. Um, we want our patients to be, we want our patients to be happy. We, it, it's challenging to deal with all of the issues around androgenetic hair loss, um, to try to get hair growing, to make sure they understand the risks and the benefits, to keep people safe, to give people hope, to make sure we're doing things right. And then to tell patients at the end of the meeting that there may be an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. These are challenging discussions, but we do need to do it. And so that's the long-winded answer uh, about a subject which is so, so important. Um, it's a systemic disease. There are systemic as associations. Is there an association between ticks or mites and LPP? Not that we know of. Um, there can be associations and other scalp issues, but not that we know of with lichen planus pilaris. Why is cyclosporin not usually prescribed? In a previous study, I see it's quite effective in LPP. Cyclosporin is very effective in lichen planus pilaris. Um, very good study a number of years ago, it's a small study, showing that cyclosporin really shuts down LPP. The problem is, is that cyclosporin has a large number of side effects. It can really damage the kidneys in many patients. It can cause high blood pressure. It can cause high cholesterol. It can cause tremor. It can cause hair growth on the face. It can cause thickening of the gums. It can cause your electrolytes to go all out of whack. There are many drugs which do not have these side effects. And so they're often seen as you to be used first before cyclosporin. But do we use cyclosporin in lichen planus pilaris? Absolutely we do. The day we start cyclosporin, we put an imaginary timer on, and that says, let's try to get the patient off in one year. Because we know when we use cyclosporin in other diseases that after one year, we kind of like to get the patient off because it can start causing some damage to the kidneys. The problem with lichen planus pilaris is it doesn't follow those rules. It doesn't say, in one year, I'm going to go to sleep and be quiet. Mm -mm. We think it does, but that's a problem with the, 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 the literature and the medical community. Some lichen planus pilaris lasts 35 years. Some never goes to sleep. Fortunately, some does. Some goes to sleep in a year or two or five. But by no means does lichen planus pilaris decide to go to sleep in one year. And you're starting a medication where you have this imaginary timer that you'd like to really stop the drug in one year. So cyclosporin has its challenges. It's a good drug. We use it when we need to, but that's why we use topical steroids, steroid injections, uh, doxycycline, hydroxychloroquine first before we move on to uh, something like cyclosporin. Are there any side effects with suddenly stopping plaquenil and doxycycline? Not really. Um, not like other medications, no. Um, the main side effect is hair loss can flare, hair scarring alopecia can flare. So generally we like to taper slowly if we can. And I'm a big believer in tapering drugs one at a time if we can. So if we can remove doxycycline first, wait a number of months, then remove hydroxychloroquine slowly, 200 milligrams a day, 200 milligrams three times a week, then that is certainly the preferred preference. But stopping other drugs quickly um, is a problem, but stopping plaquenil and doxycycline is usually not much of an issue. What's your take on PRP with or without minoxidil? I have LPP and androgenetic alopecia. 
So I think that PRP can be helpful. Um, I think PRP is a second line treatment for androgenetic hair loss and a second line option for LPP. What that means is I think there's a lot better options. Um, that doesn't mean those better options are the options that a patient's going to go with, but um, they can be helpful. And so um, I would rather that uh, a patient with lichen plano pilaris be on some treatment with uh, good evidence behind it that backs it up because I wanna save this patient's hair and any hair that's lost has the risk of being lost forever. And we don't have a lot of great, great data for LPP and PRP. Uh, and so unless my patient's on something that I know has a good chance of helping, I don't really want them on PRP yet. Um, and so it's something that I might add down the road. What treatments do you recommend for telogen effluvium rather than addressing the underlying trigger? So there are no good options for telogen effluvium except addressing the underlying trigger. Um, now, if we truly cannot address the underlying trigger, a patient um, you know, has a certain heart disease and they need to take this blood pressure pill, it's the only one that works, and we think this blood pressure pill is causing telogen effluvium, what do we do? Well, there's options for low level laser, there's options for topical minoxidil. Um, depending on the cause of the telogen effluvium, there might be options for oral minoxidil. I might not use oral minoxidil in that heart patient um, who's on this blood pressure pill for their heart disease. Um, oral minoxidil might not be my first line, but we really must try to treat the trigger. It's not always possible. There are some patients with bowel disease where they have micronutrient uh, absorption problems. There's patients with eating disorders. And um, the, you know, it's, it, it's easier said than done just to say to the referring doctors, the patient needs to increase caloric intake. So those are challenging. But in those situations where we're trying to fix the trigger, but we can't yet, um, that's where things like um, topical minoxidil, low-level laser, oral minoxidil, PRP uh, may have some value. And so I'll keep going with a few more. I thank everyone for these wonderful questions. What are your current thoughts on microneedling with or without minoxidil? I have read there are concern about derma rollers damaging hair follicles. Would a derma stamp be better? So there is some, there is some good data suggesting that maybe derma rolling does help um, androgenetic hair loss when used in combination with minoxidil. These studies need to be repeated um, and they need to be done with larger number of patients and they need to be done with a little stricter study design protocol. Um, there's no doubt about it that there are patients out there that get tremendous shedding, get tremendous hair loss and get tremendous scalp symptoms with derma rolling. That doesn't get reported. Um, I do believe that derma rolling helps a certain proportion of patients. I don't think they have a really great sense about that. Um, the one study which we love to refer to suggests that minoxidil helps 30%. And if you use derma rolling, it helps 80% or 70%. I think that data needs to be repeated. And I think we need to understand better how to use it. Um, I do like derma stamping. There's no doubt about it. We have absolutely no clue what size stamp to use. Um, some studies suggest big, bigger stamps are better than smaller stamps. D bigger, bigger needles are better than smaller needles. Some studies suggest smaller needles are better than bigger needles. You know, a recent study suggested that 0.6 was better than 1.2. Other studies have said the opposite. So the data is all over the place. And when data is all over the place, we, we need better data. And so uh, proceed cautiously. I would really like a patient to start minoxidil first. And then we can add derma rolling later once we really know how they're doing. I would rather them not start everything at once. Then we can really, it can really be difficult to know what's going on. But um, I think the derma rolling world is in the infancy. I don't think the derma rolling um, world has made it to, to preschool yet. Does micropigmentation affect follicles? Not really, um, unless you have an allergy um, and it's done properly. 
And so in good hands, micropigmentation is, is generally pretty safe. There are some people that are pretty sensitive to micropigmentation um, and they can get quite scalp irritation. And there are some patients that can get um, chronic redness from micropigmentation. Um, and so I'm a big believer in um, patients using smaller areas first, uh, if they can, if it's possible, to make sure they tolerate it, to make sure they're happy, to make sure they like the look before moving on to larger areas. Sometimes that's not possible um, because micropigmentation needs to be repeated anyways. Um, but generally it's, it's pretty well tolerated and doesn't usually affect the, the hair follicles. The hair follicle factory lives about six millimeters under the scalp and micropigmentation puts uh, pigment on the surface. And so um, it generally doesn't cause issues. Recent diagnosis with LPP, history of mild ichthyosis. Is there any correlation? Great, great question. The answer is there could be. It hasn't been studied well, um, but there are some ichthyosis disorders, and it depends on the specific type. Um, there are some ichthyosis diagnoses, which have some, um, some hair loss correlations, which are rare and haven't been studied very well, um, but it's possible. One out of every 3,000 people will have lichen plano pilaris. And so there's going to be statistically a certain number of people over time which will have these associations. And so they are challenging sometimes to figure out, but uh, the answer is depending on the type there might be. I generally, I have a generally oily scalp, always after washing. I have noticed that I get these small miniature hairs on my hand when I wash my scalp. I was diagnosed with LPP, but I assumed hair shedding of these hairs was TE. So one of the, so the short answer is, because I haven't seen your scalp, I don't know what you have. Um, but the other, um, I'm just gonna plug in my computer. Um, the biggest mistake that's made by physicians, non-physicians, trichologists, patients, is assuming that shedding means TE. And it's the number one of the number one mistakes in treating hair loss. There's 14 conditions that cause shedding. Most commonly, shedding is caused by androgenetic hair loss. And so when I see a patient with shedding, the first thing I say to myself is, let's see if it's androgenetic hair loss. I don't see, I don't say, let's see if it's telogen effluvium. That comes second. Androgenetic hair loss is the very first thing I ask. And so I don't know what you have because I haven't seen your scalp, but it's a um, misbelief, common misconception that shedding equates to telogen effluvium. Shedding can be caused by androgenetic hair loss, telogen effluvium, scarring alopecia, lichen plano pilaris, seborrheic dermatitis, psoriasis, um, dermatomyositis, lupus, um, dandruff, um, alopecia areata, so there's, and more, and more, and telogen effluvium. Can LPP be caused by fungal infections or parasites such as mites? Not usually. Um, that would be very uncommon. It hasn't been reported, and so that's not usually something that um, would trigger like in plano pilaris. Thank you. Would derma rolling cause more inflammation in someone who has lichen plano pilaris? It's a great question. The answer is it might. It's a really great question. Would derma rolling cause more inflammation? And so in patients with lichen plano pilaris, there's a phenomenon called the Kebner phenomenon, K-O-E-B-N-E-R, Kebner. And what happens in lichen plano pilaris is anytime there's injury to the scalp, sometimes lichen plano pilaris flares. So some patients with lichen plano pilaris, if they go for hair transplant surgery, their disease flares and they're worse off than before they went. That's why you have to be really, really quiet before you go for uh, hair transplant surgery. There's reports of patients um, Dr. Shapiro at NYU published a very interesting report 
of a break dancer, break dancing on their head and developed like in Plano Pilaris on their crown where they're break dancing. So any trauma can trigger like in Plano Pilaris in some patients if you have the predisposition. And so I'm terrified of patients with like in Plano Pilaris using derma rolling and rolling their, you know, these needles across their scalp and creating inflammation and bleeding. Is there a possibility it can worsen the disease? Absolutely there is. It's a, it is a very significant risk. Is there going to be people out there that say, I have LPP, I do derma rolling, it's fine, I, hair's great. Of course, there's a variation of everything. But I can absolutely assure you there's going to be people with LPP that will um, have their disease flared with derma rolling. And remember, there's many derma rollings. There's 0.2 needles, there's 0.5 needles, there's 1.2 needles, there's two needles. There's needles that look frightening. There's needles that <clears throat> you look at it and you don't even know it's a needle. So there's different depths of needles. But I think the short answer is I would be very, very cautious about injuring the scalp in um, lichen plano pilaris. So I come to an end of the questions. I want to thank everyone again who stayed till the end for uh, participating. And uh, I hope this was informative and I really am grateful for uh, you joining me this evening. This will be posted later and I hope you'll be able to use it as a reference. Thanks again and good night or good time of day wherever you are. Thanks so much.